Hello and welcome to the Lived Experience, a developing series of relaxed conversations in which guests share significant events that may have shaped aspects of their life. These conversations are in partnership with the Person-Centred Neurosciences Society and the Lifestyle Health Foundation. I'm Neil Binderman and I'm thrilled to be inviting you to watch and enjoy what for me is a very special conversation with Professor Pam Enderby, who some of you watching this will know I've had the immense pleasure of working with for many years. We started by discussing what drew Pam into speech and language therapy. I had, it, it was completely fortuitous. I'd never heard of it. Um, I went to a convent boarding school and the nuns at that time felt there were two careers for a woman, one being a good wife, failed on that front, and the second one was being um, a nurse. Those were the two options, or if you had a special calling, going into their calling. So we didn't have very much careers advice at all, and I decided maybe I'd go into teaching, and I applied to various teaching training colleges and didn't get an interview. Then I got an interview with speech therapy, so I read up a little bit about it. That was always a good idea. And I've always had a bit of a gob on me, so people felt that this might be a good profession to go into. And um, I didn't get, I got interviews, but wasn't selected for any of them, probably because I spoke too much. And anybody with a speech problem would never have got a word in edwe edgeways. Anyway, finally, I was offered a place at what was then called the Audrey Fleming College of Speech Therapists, um, which was in Hampstead, and um, hated the training, absolutely hated the training. Dreadful. I tried to start a students' union. I was so yeah. stupid because um, I, the head of the college, who did a lot of the teaching, asked me why I wanted a students' union. And I told her because the teaching standard was so poor. <laughs> this was to the principal of the college who did most of the teaching. <laughs> How stupid was that? <laughs> anyway, um, and so, um, but the first week that I got a job, I loved it. From day one, I loved it. Wow. But I really nearly didn't go into the profession. When I got into the college, I nearly didn't complete. So it was against the odds, really. And, but I loved it from day one. And wow. I was very lucky. I went to work in a place in Greenwich, uh, which was the newly built Greenwich Hospital. And I had, people were just so wonderful and supportive and encouraging and made you feel you were doing a worthwhile job. Right. And I was trying to read a chapter about the patient, the, the condition that the patient was just before they came in the door. You know, I was having to really be one sentence ahead of whatever I was doing. It makes you want to learn. Yes. Was there anything um, in your upbringing that made you sort of think about well, it? Well, not um, not going into it, but uh, when I was at college, um, my father had a stroke and um, he had the first stroke. He had affected his him physically and he was um, a chap who, I suppose this is where I got it, loved to tell a tale and he liked to be in the bar and he was a businessman and he was always out and about and very gregarious. And it didn't, the physical disability he had from the stroke didn't really stop that. He recovered very well. He had a, a strange ataxic walk, but his friends would pick him up and he could still go to the pub and still tell a tale. And then he had another stroke and physically got worse. They could manage him in the wheelchair and hold him back. But the third stroke affected his speech and suddenly all his friends evaporated. But not that out of unkindness, but they, didn't know how to cope with a speech problem. They right. didn't know how to, this gregarious person who would really join in their conversation, they didn't want to distress him. So suddenly it went and it, suddenly, it made me realize the importance of communication in every aspect of your life because he suddenly had to stop his work. He stopped his in, in enjoyment and his recreation. It was difficult in the family. There were so many things in his life that were yeah. affected from that additional disability. And um, was your mum around at the time? Yes, she was, yes. And it was very hard for her. I, I um, imagine because, it must have been, yes. Yeah. Um, it was very hard because 
obviously his frustration would vent in different ways. But in addition, he was very much the person who was in control of what happened in the house in those days was very much the male preserve. Right. And um, she didn't have any relief from that because people weren't coming around and taking him out or what, whatever. So it, the whole balance of the family changed. It's interesting how that that can happen, isn't it? Really? Yeah. Um, mm. Yeah, it, it, it's fascinating. And 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 so you were in you were in London at the. At, I was at, in London at college at that time. Right. And I was I was so dismayed with speech therapy because um, he did have speech therapy, but it was mostly using sort of teddy bear books and things like this, and you could see his horror at this, and it made me think we must be able to do better than this, for goodness sake. Right. And so in a way, it was an added motivation when I first went into work and I was working with strokes and on um, older people's wards and things like that, thinking, surely there's something more we should be doing. And I kept on feeling somebody else must know what we should be doing. And I just haven't found out about it. So it started that search of what is what should we be doing? What is good? what's helpful and all this type of thing from day one really. Did that have an impact on you wanting to go into more of the academic world as well in terms of looking for the research and the evidence base? Well to a certain extent at first I was just learning how to be a therapist <laughs> and yes. that sort of aspect and okay. learning how to relate to people but then when I went to my next job which was a couple of years on in Bristol I met some inspiring people there, and one of them being um, Richard Langton Hewer, who was a neurologist, and another one being Derek Wade, who you probably met yes. through BSRM. Yes. And they were very much into what's the evidence, and is there any evidence for speech therapy? And I'd say, oh, of course there is, thinking, <laughs> bloody hell, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> and so um, it, it drove me, and, and their um, encouragement to look at what what are you really doing do you know it's the best can it be better was really sort of got me into that way of thinking these first jobs really depend upon the people that you work with yes. you know how it motivates you and encourages you and the neurologist that you mentioned you mentioned him i think in in an email to me just recently is that the same man in relation to something to do with hope um, Richard, yes, it was. Um, Richard Langton here was an unusual neurologist because he was a neurologist who was really interested in rehabilitation. And at that time, most neurologists were into diagnosis rather than rehabilitation. So he was an early forerunner. And he was one of the people who started the SRR, the Society for Research and Rehabilitation. Mm. He was very much a founder member. And what was also unusual is that he felt that rehabilitation was interdisciplinary. But he used to say, the important thing about rehabilitation is finding the key to what turns somebody on, what makes them want to go on and giving them hope that they can get towards that. And he was very, very key on that. And again, that was so unusual in mm -hmm. the medical professions. I'm talking many years ago mm -hmm. um, and you know it has changed so much. Of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to turn to something slightly, slightly different in terms of um, the the way that you have over the years amused people in your teachings. And I and can't also, believe that. Surely it's all very serious and oh, very highbrow. Well, um, a little birdie uh, uh, of the name of Dr. Steve Barris. <laughs> <laughs> tells me otherwise um and and uh, and obviously i have a little bit of experience having listened to you um over the years with with the tom's uh workshops but you do have a number of amusing slides which i i do enjoy and i just wondered what your in in your in your view what your top three of <laughs> other slides you've got that, that well all of them of course are deadly serious and have algorithms etc 
Um, there was one slide that I particularly remember that I used on Tom's years ago, and then got requested very firmly to take it off. And it was a slide of a little boy sitting on a windowsill with a bowl of porridge. You know, he was about two and a half. And um, while he was eating his porridge, he was actually, he was in the nude and he was peeing into the porridge bowl. But he seemed to be completely oblivious to this and he was enjoying his porridge. And the point I was trying to get across is that a good outcome varies according to who's looking at it. He was very happy. He was relieving himself and not interrupting his porridge eating. He was extremely happy. Mum watching on was slightly horrified by this and she had a different view. But what was interesting is I got a couple of emails saying that it was entirely inappropriate to have a two-year-old um, child with their willy out on a slide. So um, I had to remove it and, and, and stand corrected. Yes. And the other slide that I remember, Neil, is one that you got me into trouble with. I have for many years had a final slide on the channel, <laughs> which is the washing line with knickers on it. And we have the, 19, the 1886 knickers, which are big bloomers. And then in the 1920s, they get a little bit smaller, but still quite voluminous and covering the waist and down to, to be on the thighs and then a bit further forward a little trimmer and then in the, um, 1986 89 they get down to almost a g-string and the very academic point that I'm wanting to impress on this is that during this period of time the world has got warmer global warming has impressed us all at the same time as Nick is getting smaller and of course, one could say that knickers got smaller because the world was getting warmer. But there is no particular relationship between those two things. And what I was trying to tell people, Neil, until you stopped this, um, this display of underwear, was that um, it's important to look at the difference between causation and association. Things can be associated like knickers and the, the um, the temperature outside, but it's not necessarily causal, which is important in outcome measurement. But then a few weeks ago, when you were controlling my slides and I got oh, to- I'm not this, sure I did do that. <laughs> I, I think, well, we can argue about this. I got, <laughs> to, I got to this one that I thought was going to be you, and that was, I thought was going to be the knickers, and it wasn't there, it just went blank. And I shouted at Neil, what have you, you've taken my knickers down. And you look rather horrified, but not as horrified as all <laughs> the people in this virtual workshop who, oh, were, who thought we were in the same room and they, they were going to be entertained <laughs> in a different way. <laughs> oh, so um, that, so that, it's that, a shame. That, that is a fa that's a favourite of, of mine in a way. Um, <laughs> In terms of the encounter, it was at the uh, when it happened. It was it was hilarious. That was. <laughs> it was it was just such a shame that um, this very academic point that I was going to make was overcome by chalkling. Yes, and and and, and is, is there a third? No, um, there's no okay. no more that's worth retelling. No, okay, okay. Um, well, you can't really top that one, I suppose. Um, and in terms of your kind of moments in in lecturing and teaching are there any that that spring to mind that that were kind of remain highlights in where, whether it's well, I well, always find that when I and one of the things I miss on the workshop uh, having real workshops is usually whatever teaching you do if you're in the same room with people you learn so much because you can see a reaction and you can pick up on that reaction. Why didn't you quite follow that? Or why do you not feel that that's true? Tell me about that. And you don't get that in a virtual workshop in the same way, which is an awful shame. And so, um, uh, but I, I mostly, I would say nearly always find that I learn something when I'm teaching. Sometimes it's because I've had to look something up for the teaching and that's fair enough but very often it's because of a person's reaction or what they want to expand on 
and mm -hmm. that makes it really rewarding for the teacher or the lecturer mm -hmm. rather than just being oh this is me regurgitating whatever comes out so i think you've said something that is quite fascinating for for me in terms of um you go into your 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 teaching uh, in a way that so you said you're going in that you're going to learn something mm. so you're you're very open to the fact that you are also going to learn from the people who are who you're teaching oh definitely yeah, and definitely I, and, and that's a and that's a skill i think that that's is that something that you think is one of the reasons why you do speech and language therapy as well or well, it's um, probably because um, it's in rehabilitation. I've broadened it out from speech and language therapy to rehabilitation. And I've always had the fortune of working with great colleagues in physio and OT and dietetics and many others. And, and um, none of us, when you meet a patient that requires our services, none of us know that the answer that's right for them. Um, so it is always a position of sort of learning as well as, and that uh, um, there's no sort of flow diagram. You do this, then you do that, then you do the other. There is nothing like that in rehabilitation. You might need to start it further down the, the line, or you may have to go further back, or you may have to actually hold back until there's a certain point. And that's what makes it constantly fascinating. I can't think that anybody would go into this and not be interested. Mm -hmm. Do you have any particular moments from, from the teaching that, that you've done, even at university, from maybe, maybe a, a student that, that, that springs to mind from, from teaching that you... That, that, that sort of um, has, an, has had an impact on you in, in any way? Well, so many uh, things, but what is fascinating is so many students, and it's interesting we're talking about this now because I think this is even more pertinent. So many students bring their own life, well, they all bring their own life history and their, which affects their views and what they feel is important, what's not so important. And, um, it's interesting how many people have gone into their profession because of a family experience and seeing what that is. And it's finding out about that's quite important because the because you've had a family experience doesn't mean that that's true for every family. Mm -hmm. So some, some students might come in and think, this is what it was like, and this is what I'm going to change, and this is how I'm going to do it. And of course, that might be right in that family, but it may not be right in another family at all. So it's sort of the teaching process is a two-way process. But actually, I came to teaching and lecturing very late in life. I'd done more than 30 years of being a clinician and working in rehab and working in a broad range of settings. So I worked in acute hospitals and rehab and a learning disability hospital and a, um, a, mentally, a mental health hospital and all these places um, for many years and mm -hmm. seen such changes because one of the mental health hospitals I worked in had more than a thousand beds and they still at that time had people who had been put in there because they'd had an Ill illegitimate child Oh, wow. That, and they'd been in hospital in a mental health hospital for 15, 20 years because they'd had an illegitimate child. There was many people in there because they hadn't had a diagnosis of deafness. And when, you know, I know I'm old, but I'm not that old. So, we, you know, it's, we forget that we have come on a long way. And things have improved. It, it, we feel the frustrations every day of what we're not able to do. But I think sometimes it's good to take time out and think, hey, we have progressed and mm. we will go on doing that as long as we don't get overwhelmed by frustration and thinking we our little bit is too small to count. It isn't. No. It can just slowly plod on. I, I agree. Mm. Uh, you said that you... You were in uh, actually providing um, the, the speech and language therapy for uh, many years before you went into um, academia. Um, what what was the, um, the what was the um, 
factor that that drew you in to <laughs> Well, it was, again, very fortuitous. Most of my life is sort of lucky options. Um, but uh, I was asked by uh, Sheffield University to look at the job description for a new professor role. And so I helped write this um, job description and then thought, that's quite a nice job. And I was doing quite a bit of research down in the NHS. And I thought, crumbs, I could do more of that up there. And I quite fancy being called a professor. Oh, that would be good. Um, so I, I actually applied for the job and got it. But the, uh, one thing that they keep reminding me is that in my application, I spelt professor wrong. So the, which was not a good, was not a tick on the, on the thing. But it was so lucky. I was so lucky. And I was very lucky to have a long clinical background because it's that that makes you think, why am I doing this research? What do we want to improve? And to give a drive to that, not just an academic, oh, well, that looks interesting. Is yeah. there a purpose for it that really drives one on? How do we draw more people from the allied health professions into doing more research, in your view? I think we have to make research more accessible to them. The awkward thing is, is that when I first started doing research, is that there wasn't quite the bureaucracy associated with setting up research. So one could do pilot studies and small studies and collect little bits of data without um, big ethics forms. And I know ethics is important, but sometimes you think just asking a few questions in a structured way, do I really need to fill in a 15 page form and get permission to do that? Oh, so nice. it has become more bureaucratically restrained. Um, in addition, I think some of the methodologies that are now seen as important stop people from starting. Whereas I was able to say, oh, well, I wonder what that, I'll ask a few people and see if there's some consensus. That was such a lovely, easy way to get into research. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and now it's become very much more driven by specifications, by governance, by ethics, all important, but perhaps is off-putting to somebody who trained as a good physiotherapist, occupational therapist or whatever. Mm -hmm. it's, it looks like a big hurdle before you start. Mm -hmm. And so we've got, I think we should try and make things more accessible. Yeah. And in terms of your long term interest in, in outcomes and, and outcome mm -hmm. measures, what, what drew you into wanting to, to develop something like the therapy outcome measures? It was almost on my first day of working in the hospital in Bristol, which was the French Air Hospital, had a very large cleft palate unit. And suddenly, having never seen um, a person with a cleft palate or a child with a cleft palate, I was suddenly involved in that. And I wanted to see what had this previous speech therapist had done and what the pre outcomes were. What, what did she do and did it work? And it horrified me that that unit had been going for oh, 20 odd years and there was no data that could help me pick up and think, oh, those people with that particular problem, she did that and it seemed to help in that way. And it was just really to, to help me start where she had left. And uh, there was nothing like that, there was no data. So we didn't even know in those days how many patients were referred to speech and language therapy? And yet sure. the department had been open for years. Sure. We didn't know what were the types of problems referred. So it's very basic. So it started off with, let's just get to know what we're doing. Let's have a good register. And it started off like a register. You know, this person was referred by this, they're that gender, they're that age, and we treat them five times. Mm -hmm. And it was so basic and it was quite horrific, I think, that um, that a very top notch hospital had this department that really didn't know what it was doing or who it was doing it with. Mm -hmm. And yet we'd had brilliant speech therapists beforehand. It was just not the way of doing things in those days. 
Mm-hmm. And so it was just getting a structure to get some sort of idea of what was going on. And obviously the the therapy it must be um must be very pleasing to see the therapy outcome measures being being used now by by so many services uh, across the country. Yes, and I think it's really helping at the moment at this um, at the point of recording, as they say, um, it, we've got nearly fifty thousand um, patients on the national database held by the Royal College who've mm-hmm. had experience of speech therapy. So we, it's not only important from the point of view of looking at what's happening and where is it happening and why is it different here than there, you know, all those things that are so important. Politically, it's very important that the Royal College can now present speech therapy knowing the types of patients that are getting referred, is there, uh, is there equal access over the country? Um, how long are people being treated? When? It, what are they like when they're discharged? It gives them so much power to have some numbers. Yes. We've depended upon the anecdote for a long time. And right previously, people would talk about the severity of the speech disorder or the language disorder of swallowing. But actually, speech therapy is only one bit of that and attending to that. You know, it's trying to reduce the anxiety of the mum is the important part of uh, speech therapy. And we had no data on that to begin with. We had no data on how many people um, that have this particular speech and language problem um, can't access work. Mm-hmm. Can't um, don't have recreational opportunities. All those things that therapists of all types really help. So we had some data on what we do for the disorder, but that was only one bit of what I felt was the picture. And I'm delighted now that we do have a better picture of our impact. That doesn't mean to say that in the future we don't need to gather something else to reflect the future. And um, the Toms, I think it's right at this time, but I don't think it necessarily be right forever. Yes. You know, we might well need to gather other information as disorders change, as interventions change, as surgery changes, mm-hmm. drugs change, etc. It, it's interesting. Obviously, there are many services using it, um, but there are still um, we're still hearing that there are reasons people are, or, or we're hearing that they've decided not to take it up. Um, yeah. because they've, they've, they've had concerns perhaps from the therapist or clinicians um, that, that, it, that it may have a bias um, yeah. given that they are the ones who are doing the, the, the actual measuring. Um, mm. is, is there any, you have any thoughts on how we could get the therapist to address that, possible, that, that issue? Yeah, there are quite a few barriers to people taking up the TOMS. One of the barriers is to do with um, the databases that they're presently using and uh, a lot of therapists despite the digital promises um, for encouraging everybody in different services to have access to digital records etc there is still an awful lot of allied health professions who have very poor systems or systems that don't accommodate their particular um, in interventions, etc. So that's one big problem. The other big problem is that a lot of people put data in and it goes into a black hole and don't aren't able to get data out in yeah. reports. So yeah. they can't check, is it really reflecting what we think feels right? And it's so frustrating when you do see a report that doesn't feel right to you. It doesn't encourage you to go on with it. So we have to look at how can therapists put data in and get reports out that then inform them. And then they might think, hey, yes, that's right. Or yeah, we knew that was a little bit weak or something like that. That's encouraging to go on. But you're right that some people feel that if you are doing it, are doing um, a view on somebody, and you are that therapist, surely you would be slightly biased to showing that the second score was better than the first score. 
Mm. Well, that's true of virtually everything we do in the, the NHS, is that there's a clinical judgment with regard to um, uh, things improving or not improving. And we all, as therapists, would be discussing this with the patient, do you feel you're improving or what's, what are the problems now, hopefully. But the key thing is having good ways of making sure that your, your judgments are similar to your colleagues' judgments on a particular issue. And that's why the descriptions in the TOMS have had to be um, defined for many different conditions. Because if I said, oh, this person's got a moderate dysphasia, am I sure that that term moderate is the same as my colleague's view of yeah. moderate. And yeah. we use that term moderate more than we use severe or mild. So it covers a big spectrum. So the thing that Tom's really had to do was to find what do we mean by severe? What do we mean by severe moderate? What do we mean by moderate? What do we mean by moderate mild? What do we mean by mild? So that we can all agree that. And then hopefully we get the reliability and that assists. Yes. The other thing that can help with regard to um, checking on bias is comparing one service with another service and thinking, why are they getting people that are doing so much better? Um, mm -hmm. Is it because, in fact, they've got more support or they do more treatment or they've um, got a club associated to encourage conversation or whatever? Is it what they're doing and is it distinctly different? Mm -hmm. Or is it because they actually need to check on their reliability and they might have some people who have got more of a dove-like approach rather than a hawk-like approach to scoring? That's interesting because maybe you could also compare um, the nature of the, the problem that the patient presents with between the two services like that. So oh, you, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things we've been doing in the COVID time is looking at the data from last year, March to August, with this year, March to August. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that the children that are being referred to speech and language therapy have a slightly higher start score than last year. And that's possibly because the referrals of a broader range of problems are restricted because health visiting has stopped to a certain extent oh. and health, health visiting of course often picks up developmental problems in families that might have social disadvantage and they will encourage whereas perhaps the children who are a little bit more able um, are being referred because it's more obvious that the problem is that they're not silent children or whatever. So people might not be quite so worried, but a little bit concerned and able to take them to or ring up the GP or ring up the speech therapist. So it could be showing that people at social disadvantage is, are particularly disadvantaged in accessing developmental clinics. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just a thought. Now that's the speculation. But um, it goes along with some of the other things that we're hearing is that people in social disadvantage um, are having a higher impact on uh, losing their job, on having a difficulty with accessing education because of um, the internet not being available in their house, and things like that, not being able to get information on what services are available. So there's lots of knock-on effects that are complex mm -hmm. that we can just look at What's the impact on speech and language therapy? What's the impact on physiotherapy? What's the impact on OT? And that's very useful because nobody at government level is going to be looking at that detail. So we have to look at that. Yes. Um, I'm just going to come back a little bit more towards sort of the, um, some of the, fav maybe some of your, your favourite moments as well. And, mm -hmm. and whether there'd be, um, one question I've got in front of me here really is, um, what would be your most significant achievement today across all aspects of your work? And what, if anything, would you still wish to achieve? Oh, goodness gracious. Well, coping with you, of course, is one of the great... <laughs> 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 um, uh, I think the three things that 
took a lot of effort and um, I feel, I feel it's, it's embarrassing, I feel slightly proud of, is one is the AAC services and setting those up and sort of encouraging the technology to support people with communication disorders. And it's so amazing how technology has really improved. But the thing that's disappointing is the getting the technology to the right person and then giving the support and training so they can really use it. So um, there are still challenges there, but we've come so such a long way. And the importance of that being an interdisciplinary team so that the teacher knows about the technology, the um, clinical scientist, the assistive technology scientist really works with the therapist to see um, how what's best for that individual. The OT helping with uh, the seating strategy and access to switches and things like that, truly interdisciplinary. And um, the thing that I think services find difficult to understand is that it's ongoing. Most people that require AAC will require AAC for the rest of their lives, from young to old. And those services have to go on supporting those individuals because technology changes yes. so much. And um, I remember the Canon communicator that you strapped to your arm and it uh, you typed something out and a piece of ticker tape came out and you tore that off and gave it to the person. But one of the best bits of a, um, was called, uh, oh, I can't even remember what it was called. It was a device that the message came out on an LED in a brooch. So you typed and it, the message came across the top of your bosom. Um, if you had an ample bosom, it was even better because you could display more, not of the bosom, <laughs> but of the message. But what was it? We were piloting this, and the um, uh, power pack, the battery pack, had to be hung on the waistband. And in those days, batteries were big. And the first message I saw coming out of this communicator was, my trousers are coming down. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> the, the battery pack was just slowly uh, sort of making it feel less and less yes. secure. So oh. that was one of the first messages on that particular communication aid. So that's one bit. The other bit, of course, was the equal pay case that went on for 14 years. And there are quite a few tales of that, but life's too short to tell you now about them. But it was uh, just a long slog. And I think it's one of the things that I think is the, the importance of just keeping going sometimes, just keeping going. It wasn't stressful. Mm -hmm. The press kept on saying, has this sort of been terribly stressful? And I'd really disappoint them by saying, no, it isn't. But isn't it interesting that mm -hmm. men are paid more for doing virtually the same thing as a woman? I couldn't understand how people would not see that that was ridiculous. Yeah. And I think at another time, if you've got a few people around a table with a cup of tea, it wouldn't have taken 14 years, it would have taken two hours to yeah. say, look, this is daft. It was probably appropriate before in a different culture, in a different mindset, but perhaps we should be working to get out of this and let's have a strategy. And we shouldn't have needed to do 14 years and go to Europe and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But we didn't, the thing that frustrated me is that then it got into, oh, the NHS owes an awful lot of money to these women because of years of back pain. If we got at the beginning and say, we will work towards it, I don't think they would have had to spend so much money and it would have been much less mm -hmm. acrimonious. Mm -hmm. You're probably absolutely right there. Um, yeah. last, last question, you'll be pleased to... To, to, to know um it, it's actually to do it's more back to the sort of the patient the patient side and yep. um i just was wondering um what would be one thing that you have learned from your numerous patient interactions um that altered your approach to your patient care in the years <laughs> well um there's not one, there's so many, right. and you learn. Right. And I think the interesting thing is, I can't say one person, because it's all the time, and it's always the surprise. Some of the things that have really taken me aback 
is when I've been doing something with a good intention and it's been taken as negative or it's had a, a negative impact. Yeah. And it's that sort of, that makes you sort of um, be a little more cautious or a little bit more, um, just think about, is there a different view to this? Remember assessing somebody's vocabulary with the different picture cards and they put in a complaint and I was a bit horrified and they, they were complaining because they thought that I was testing their intelligence. And it was very clear that I had not made it clear to this individual that I wasn't testing their intelligence, I was testing their vocabulary and just saying which words they found difficult. And so I, I did that terrible thing of assuming somebody was understanding what I was doing and why I was doing it. Uh -huh. And that was a very good lesson to learn because I think one becomes so familiar with what you're doing and why you're doing it. And you don't realize this is the first time for this person. This is the first time they've been through this thing with somebody in an office. Yes. And it's easy to forget that. I think that's a, that's a really lovely way, um, I think, to, to sort of come to a conclusion with this conversation, Pam. I'll be, I'll treasure this for a long time. <laughs> oh, um, for goodness sake. You need to get a life, Neil. <laughs> no, no. No, I said to I said to Eleanor um, that working working with you over the years has been not just a career highlight, but for me, <laughs> it's been a life highlight. It's been wonderful. Well, well, Neil, that's very kind of you, but I I would like to repeat that you need to get a life. <laughs> <laughs>